Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? How you doing? Are you ready? We're nearly there. It's not far away now. Football, after a long break, is very much on its way back. This time, next week, we will have played a game of Premier League football and we will be preparing for another one against... I should have looked this up, shouldn't I? It's Brighton, isn't it? It is Brighton. It's Man City, and then it's Brighton on the Saturday. Let me have a look, double check. Yes, it's Brighton in Brighton. Go brain. You haven't atrophied completely during this this shutdown. So look, we're gonna get ready for the Premier League. We're gonna we're gonna talk football in a little while. We're gonna talk about what it's gonna be like to have the uh, the games back, what we can expect based on some of the stuff we've seen elsewhere, and I'll give you the intro to our guests in just a couple of minutes' time. Of course, we did play a game during the week against Brentford. Um we lost. 3-2. Can we draw any real conclusions from it? Nah. Should we be worried? Mm-hmm. Is it time to get the pitchforks out? Not yet. Not yet. Um, it's a fitness thing. It really is a fitness thing and a sharpness thing. And of course, you can worry that if Brentford can take advantage of our defensive lapses, then so too can Manchester City, who are just a little bit, with all due respect to any Brentford fans listening, just a little bit better than you guys. Just a little bit, though. Mikel Arteta didn't sound that worried when he was talking to uh, Sky Sports uh, today, Thursday. He was asked about the the preparations, and he said, they're going well, very different to our usual preparations. We're getting all our protocols right. The players are getting used to it. It's been a challenge for the coaches, but we're happy with how it's going. Uh, we've been trying different things. We've been giving minutes in the legs to all the players, and you have to change a lot of players as well throughout the game and getting adapted to playing in an empty stadium, not having that energy from fans, etc., etc. But it was good. So, you know, perhaps he's a bit more encouraged by what he's seeing on a day-to-day basis rather than in a, a friendly game against Brentford, in which I think we went ahead twice and uh, ended up losing, uh, conceding some goals in the last 20 minutes or so. Maybe there's a lesson there. Maybe there's a lesson in how to manage the games now, how to deal with substitutes. And, of course, they can use five subs. That's something we're going to discuss in a few minutes' time. But, look, the Manchester City game on Wednesday is something that James and I will preview on Monday on the Arsecast Extra. Hopefully there will have been some kind of, I don't know, press conference or media release or uh, team news update so we can get a an idea of who is is fit properly. You might have noticed that Granit Xhaka, for example, hasn't played uh, in either of the two friendly games against Charlton or against Brentford. Neither has Cedric Suarez. He arrived injured with a knee problem, and right now he seems to have something of a face problem because he's wearing those one of those Phantom of the Opera masks. So there's something up with Cedric, um, and uh, he doesn't appear to be uh, fully fit. So how much he's going to be involved in, in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, we will do more, and we will look ahead to that game against Man City on Monday uh, in the Arscast Extra. Today, though, with the Premier League coming back, I thought it might be interesting to, uh, you know, have a chat about that and some of the wider uh, implications of it. And what can we learn from football coming back in Germany, as it did a couple of weeks ago with the Bundesliga? Are are there things that have happened there that that might give us some insight into how things are going to go uh, in terms of the Premier League? So today, I'm delighted to have a little bit of a podcast crossover with the guys from the Stadio podcast. It's Musa and Ryan. Hi, Musa. Hi, Ryan. How are you doing, Hi, Andrew? Uh, I'm good. How are you guys? Very well, thanks. Very well indeed. All right. In there. Ryan, let me ask you first, how are you feeling just generally about the return of, of the Premier League? I know football has been back in Germany where you you two guys are, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. But but in terms of the, the Premier League and in the context of everything that's going on, how are you feeling about, about it coming back? Um, a little bit strange, to be honest, still. It still feels quite strange that football is starting to return with everything that's going on especially i mean the pandemic was enough of a reason then but then with everything that's been going on in the last few weeks with protests and the situation on that front Mm. it's it's a very 
very cliche position to take, but football isn't the most important thing. I am glad it's coming back, but it also just feels really strange. And also the timing, it keeps, um, I keep seeing these things come up of, it was however many years ago today that so-and-so scored a World Cup goal. Mm. And we're just talking about Premier League coming back. So everything is just really weird. And I'm glad it's coming back in one sense, slightly dreading it from an Arsenal sense, because I've... I'm an Arsenal fan, as everyone will know, and honestly, I had quite a nice time without them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just very, very strange. Um, slight excitement, slight concern, slight, I don't really know where I am with this. So yeah, a bit of a boring answer, but not too sure. No, I don't think that's a, an unreasonable position to take at all. It is surreal, and I think... You know, when you step back and you look at it, there is an element of of it's coming back because they want to um, get the football calendar back to something like it was before. Uh, and by playing the games now, it means they can more or less do that. I think things will be stretched out a bit. But Musa, um, from your point of view, you know, how are you viewing it? Are, are you feeling the same way that it is strange and surreal? Or is there sort of more of an undercurrent of excitement or or even a case of, well, look, this doesn't feel important at all? I think it's actually the first thing. I think I feel like Ryan, it's disorientating. You know, there's that point in the summer holidays where you actually forget what day of the week it is. Yeah. Yeah. Or like the Christmas holidays, you just forget that it's like a Sunday or a Monday. It's like that. There's, I have no sense of what the football calendar is, if that makes sense. I've got no sense of the urgency of the competitions. The intensity is gone. And it's not that I'm not welcoming football back. It's not that. It's just that like it's so strange having had this prolonged absence and I'm not sure how readily I will welcome it all back, if that makes sense. Not that I don't want to see football back. It's just that, you know, in the time that football has been away, we've all created different emotional spaces in our lives for things. And I'm just, I'm not sure how football's going to fit back into that so easily, but, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Yeah. And look, it's back in Germany. It has been back in Germany for, for a couple of weeks. And, yeah. you know, you guys are a bit more uh, on the ball there. Musa, just sort of sticking with you. Uh, you know, I when it came back, I have to apologize to the uh, to the, the club, the fans and, and the people of Berlin, because I threw my lot in with Union Berlin just to sort of <laughs> have some sort of vague interest. And when I look at their results, uh, I, I feel quite guilty because it's clearly my fault that they haven't won a game since football has come back. But you know what has it been like in Germany for football to 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 be back on the on the screens? Um, you know, I think the situation in Germany and in England is very different in terms of you know where they are in in dealing with COVID nineteen and the pandemic and, and the societal impacts of that. So, um, from that point of view, can you give us a bit of insight into how it was received when it when it came back? Okay, so I would say the majority of people in Germany weren't in favor of it coming back but i would say that it's come back with so little fanfare um so little controversy that people are ultimately thinking it was a really good idea to have it return um not everyone but i think most people are like actually this has been a success in terms of how it's been executed and in terms of on the field it's been funny because the first week they came back they start a little bit gingerly and you know with the exception of Bayern Dortmund which is superb mm. but then you had well, you know, the first couple of weeks, it was a bit ginger, but now the intensity of the games is really high. The quality is really good. And I think the really weird thing will be having crowds back in the stadium because it's going to be like, you know, when you turn your TV on and the volume's up much higher than you thought it was. Mm -hmm. So you sort of jump back and, you know, in alarm. I think the first games with crowds back in the stadium are going to be like that. There's going to be this real alarm, this kind of sense of we've had this really intense football on the pitch. And now we've got the intensity to match, which, of course, as Ryan has often said, is, is the full Bundesliga experience. Ryan, any thoughts on, you know, what you've seen on the pitch and, and you know, how, how having football back has had an impact on, on football fans? I know you can't speak for football fans as, as a whole, but as a football fan uh, and talking to football fans over there, you know, is, there a, is it welcome? Um, and, and how does it feel to see teams that you're invested in play out in this context? Because that's what I'm kind of interested in. I can look at Bundesliga and I can see the games and you know, it's it's not easy for me uh, to connect uh, because I don't have any emotional investment in, in any of the teams. Uh, sorry, Union Berlin. But, uh, you know, 
when you are a fan of a club and when you are a fan of, of what they do on the pitch, you know, how, how is it to see it in this context where there are no fans, where a, a fundamental part of the football experience is missing? I think it just strips it back to being a process a little bit. That's what I've found. Um, they have, we have a thing in Germany on Sky called the Conference, which is kind of like a red zone, which you can watch all of the games that are happening at that time and they dart around depending on whether there's a goal or some action. And I deliberately watched the Saturday games using that because I found that the lack of fans was less alienating, less weird, if that makes sense. Like mm. it, it was... Um, I, I still I still struggle watching games without fans in terms of it being an experience but because as we've said a million times the fans make up such a major 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 part of what makes the Bundesliga special uh, as a viewing experience and as a match going experience I sometimes watch stuff on BT Sport and I actually watched a game last week I can't remember what it was I think it might have been the Dortmund Hertha game I turned it off because of the they had the artificial fan noise on and I found that more jarring than watching games without mm. any fan noise because that to me is where it gets into a bit of a an area that I feel really uncomfortable with. There's a bit of a debate going on as you've probably seen it online, you know, some people like the fan noise, some people don't. But I think the fact that it's even an option there has created a, a complication with the Bundesliga's return that it just didn't need to create because fans groups in Germany are really, really key to pushing a lot of um, like societal issues. And they, for example, buy a lot of Bayern Munich Ultras groups will call out the club for their links to Qatar sponsorship and all of this kind of thing. They were some of the people who were first driving for the Bundesliga to shut down because of COVID mm. fans groups. And then when, and then originally they were really, really against the return um, behind closed doors. They softened it slightly, although they, you do see still quite a number of protests in terms of banners or um, like the FC Cologne fans, for example, just before their first game at home after the return, they just put a sofa outside the stadium, <laughs> was, you know. Um, so I think that's where it gets into tricky territory for me because... I'm personally of the belief that if football is going to return, then our experience as I, I used it on the, our podcast actually as an Arsenal, uh, speaking as an Arsenal fan, would I want to watch an Arsenal game at the Emirates Stadium on TV with a load of artificial fan noise pumped in, replacing the people who pay to go there to create that atmosphere? Mm. No, because that's 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 creating something to fulfill my needs as a viewer more so than the fans who can't legally be there. Does that make sense? So yeah, I think for me, I'd rather, this is the product as it is at the moment and yeah, it might be jarring and yeah, it might not be as exciting or as entertaining or as fun as watching it with a full stadium, but this is how it's got to be at the moment and therefore it should be presented as so, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so that has created a bit of friction in Germany. However, I do think that the overall thought before the Bundesliga return was that it was too soon however the the lack of positive tests since the the fixtures have been played has been really really um has been really really positive and um I think people have maybe softened on that view and they kind of just know that it's got to it's got to get done especially because Bayern look like they've wrapped up the league now so yeah it's more of the Dortmund Leipzig Gladbach Leverkusen kind of four beneath that and then the race well the 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 struggle for relegation that's where it's getting exciting now but it is it still feels like it's very much just like this is a process we have to get done mm. as opposed to this is a really exciting climax of the season sure Musa so any thoughts on uh, before we talk a little bit about you know what's ha what's happened on the pitch and maybe the impact of the shutdown on the players and the teams just on that that situation with crowd noise and people will say well look the majority of people who watch football watch it uh, from their television or, or on their television rather um, so if you make the product attractive to them or, or exciting for them you're not doing any harm I, I personally I'm sort of with Ryan in that I feel like 
A, maybe there's a responsibility on our part, and I can't tell anyone what to think, but but we have to be aware of why we're in this situation and why uh, the stands are empty. There's a very good and there's a very sad reason why the stands right. are empty, right? So I think we kind of have to face up to that reality. I think it's important. I know that's not something um, everyone will like, and, and maybe people want to have the distraction. So um, I think that's one side of it, but, but I agree with the idea that you know, the people who go to games week in, week out, whether they go home, whether they go home and away, whatever it is, you know, it's the old cliche about fans being the lifeblood of the game, but they are, they are what create the atmosphere. You know, the players play the game and of course what they do has an impact on the people in the stadium, but the atmosphere and the way we feel about the incidents within the game come from the response of the crowd and the people who are in there. And to me, it feels just maybe a little bit disrespectful to the people uh, who go to games every week uh, to sort of say, well, look, you know, tough luck to you, but we can recreate what you do via technology, via soundboards, via special effects, via CGI um uh, you know, uh, augmented reality, whatever it might be, we can fill those stands so it doesn't look jarring to the viewer, but the reality is something completely different. Yeah, to be honest, I, I agree with all of that. Like, I'm not going to dissent on that. I actually think it's really good having the stadiums empty with no noise because it reminds everyone what they're missing. Mm. You know, it's, it's like when you move to a certain town and you can't find all the spices you want to make your favorite recipe, right? You don't, you don't, you, you can't make an, it's a pale imitation of the original recipe what we're seeing at the moment in the football stadiums. And I think it makes people all the more keen for the return of the main spectacle. And I think by, um, by, by pumping in fan noise, you dilute the quality, if that makes sense. And you almost make a mockery or a parody of the original, the original scene. And mm. the, word, the word product is really interesting because the more you keep adding these synthetic elements, the more it becomes a product and divorced from its original form. So yeah, I agree with you. I, I'm not really a fan of fan noise um, being pumped in. I like the echo. I like actually hearing the players shout. I like hearing what they're going on about. I like yeah. hearing, you know, the crack of a tackle and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm good without. Just, just sticking with you then, Musa, for for one second. Just taking this on a, off on a tangent a little bit, and I think. Um, you know, we might worry that in the future, these technologies which have been brought in as a kind of emergency measure might be things that are implemented as the game goes forward, you know, to viewers and, and broadcasters can use these tools to to make the product again seem more attractive. One of the other things that, that occurs to me is because of um, social distancing and restrictions and everything else, are there rules for the press over there that um, have have changed the game in any way? Um, I don't quite know what's going to happen in terms of Premier League, but there are suggestions that uh, post-game press conferences won't be happening. Uh, questions can be submitted by journalists to the to the press officers uh, and then to the managers to get uh, some insight and information. It strikes me that that's maybe a little bit of a dangerous road to go down because if there's a difficult question, it becomes impossible for it to be asked. You know, you can ask it, but they're not going to pass that message on. So has there been any impact on on the coverage of the game by the media in Germany because of what's happened? Can I say a couple of things? I will say, actually, Ryan is someone that attends more games here than I do and certainly more press conferences, so he's best placed for this. The one thing I will notice, or the, a couple of things I've noticed is, look, footballers drifting away from accountability for direct questions, that has that was prior to COVID. That was well prior to the mm. pandemic. You know, we were seeing footballers have their own branded content, their own channels. And I don't think that this pandemic has really accelerated that because frankly, if footballers want to, if football clubs want to avoid hard questions, they will, that they'll do that regardless. Um, what's been interested has been the restricted access. So a friend of ours, Rio Vokal, fantastic photographer, really struggling to get access for games. Um, and he's one of the best photographers around. So that's really cut his workload. And then you've got obviously access to games like the Classica, where because of safety concerns, they were handing out very, very few press passes. But having said that, Andrew, these are all, look, these are pretty temporary problems. If we consider like three months ago, Ryan, it would have been unthinkable we'd be sitting here now. Like there was one point where it felt like this lockdown was going to be unending, like not unending, but like at least until October. Like if someone had said to you in the depths of the German lockdown, we'll be like this till well into the year, well into the autumn, I would have mm. been like, yeah, I would have taken money on that. But because we've come here so fast, I really think these restrictions we're talking about will be far more temporary than we all 
than we all think at the moment. Ryan, any thoughts on that in terms of you know what the what the media um, I'm not going to say have to put up with, but the way it will have changed uh, the media uh, access to games and the way it's been reported. I mean, has there been any change in in for example newspaper reports or, or television reports or or post game content, if you like? I mean, one of the other things it, it strikes me is that it might allow clubs to sort of push out their own interviews with players, which may not be quite as, as, uh, as, as uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Challenging, perhaps, as they might be if you're dealing with the, with the press in general. I mean, actually, weirdly, I think the, the post-game press conference or the post-game interviews have become a lot more focused. Um, there seems to be a little bit more time between when the games finish and when you see players being interviewed. Um I don't know if you saw, but Archie Rintour is a really good mm. follow. He covers the Bundesliga for the international feed. And he interviewed um, Thomas Muller after the Classico, I think it was. I think it was the Classico, or was it maybe another game where he was talking, He and he did an interview in English, he was talking about Alfonso Davis, and that was when he dropped the, the Meep Meep Roadrunner thing. <laughs> so there's a weird, actually, I think there's kind of a bit more of a, kind of we're all in this together vibe. Um, and there's a bit of distance that <laughs> the, the journalist has to hold like a big, long mic on a pole kind of thing so they're quite a way away and i think maybe that actual little bit of distance has created a bit more of a relaxed post-game interview um atmosphere but in terms of access to games it's massively massively limited i applied for a game not too long ago and it was limited to 10 10 journalists in the press box which right is really really small it's a strange one isn't it because you know there's lots more room for journalists than there might have been yeah. previously i think it's i think it's more to do with the um it might differ club to club based on their uh, facilities but i think it's actually just more to do with a getting there b getting in the um getting from the entrance up to the press box and i think it's more to do with the the inner workings of the stadium as opposed to just the actual space there is to sit right and um in terms of press conferences, everything's been done digitally here. So it's kind of been on Zoom or whatever, stuff like that. And the managers still sit in front of the advertised, you know, the, the boards behind them with all the sponsors on. Mm. But they just sit there on the laptop, uh, which has been quite good. But I think I, I haven't noticed a huge amount of difference in terms of, I mean, obviously there's been l less volume of available interviews because there's no mix zone or anything like that. So you can't just just grab a player or a manager yeah. and get a few quotes after a game. But also, I think it goes to what we were saying before, that this, is, this isn't this is football as we know it. This is just something we've got to get through in order to get that back. So I think people are maybe a little bit more relaxed. I think there is a bit of a sense of, okay, this isn't the be-all and end-all at the moment, as it used to be when you'd have a load of dudes clamoring around a player in a mix. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Musa, what's the biggest thing you've noticed about the football itself since uh, since it's come back in terms of, you know, perhaps the physical impact on the players or, or teams or the way that games are managed. You know, what is the, is there one thing that sort of stands out? Yeah, I just say the intensity. Um, and this, you know, Bayern Munich have looked terrifying in recent weeks, um, which is impressive. They've really come in to close that, that out. And I will say as well, the biggest difference, you look at Union and how they've struggled, Union Berlin, they've really struggled from the absence of fans because there are some games where, you know, they're, they're, they're very much, they're a symbiotic club. They draw so much from their support and vice versa um, because they're not a team that create that many chances from open play. They're pretty good on the break, but they're not really the best playmaking team. And they've really suffered. There's no, it's no coincidence their form has plummeted with the absence of their crowd. And I think that it's funny. We were thinking at the start of this title race that it would help clubs like Gladbach and Dortmund, who mm. hadn't really won a league title. You know, Gladbach in particular in that in that long, that would help them without a crowd, where games felt less important without the crowd behind them and the pressure, perhaps. But what I think it's really done is it's kind of exposed the extent to which teams draw passion from their surroundings and Bayern have just been so clinical uh, in that context. So that, I think that's the big difference. Would that make you worried that this is something that suits the, the big teams more than the smaller teams because maybe of the depth of the squad or? 
I think it depends on the relationship that the team has with the crowd. If that makes sense. Like mm. Union is a, maybe Union is a specific and particular case. Maybe it's even a unique case, but they are very much a, a club where when you play against Union, you don't play the team, you play the club. Mm. Like you play, you play Kerpenick, you play East Berlin, you get there through the trees way out East and you're in it, you know, you're in the amphitheater and now it's like a squash court and that's not their fault. That's not their fault at all, but it takes away such a huge part of their, of their strength. It's like cutting Samson's hair. Mm. Has the five subs rule made a significant difference, Ryan, or is it uh, a case that managers are, are uh, sort of sticking to what they know which is, you know, the the three subs. I, I thought I saw something the other day about how um, quite often the five subs are not being used, despite the fact that there are concerns over, um, you know, the physical um, limitations that the players might have having not played for such a long time. I suppose the other aspect of that is whether or not making that many changes is beneficial in terms of cohesion, et cetera, et cetera. It hasn't really made that much of an impact at all, especially on the flow of the game, because they can still only made, make those subs with three mm. changes, if that makes sense. So um, <clears throat> so most most of the time you'll see two changes instead of one. But uh, you notice it a little bit more at the end of games that have that have been won, or just to close out games. Um, Dortmund away at Paderborn was a prime example where I couldn't keep up with who was coming on, but... I, I quite like it actually. I quite like the five sub thing, and I think again, at the moment, this is how it is. It hasn't had a huge impact on the flow of the game at all. Like I said, pretty much nothing, and you know, it just means also that it, I, I, it's, it's something else. Le- it's something less that for people to argue about on Twitter as to why a manager didn't bring so and so on because they get two extra chances. Ch- uh, two extra. Ta- I can't speak. They get two extra chances to bring those people on now, you know. So um, the likelihood of seeing the sub that you wanted in order to change the game has has gone up. Um, I quite enjoy it. Intro. Is it something you would keep when football goes back to normal? Does it bring an extra uh, tactical element to the game, or is it a thing that people talk about how it, it, it's sort of uh, three subs are sacrosanct? But you know, it wasn't long ago that you only had one sub, and then there was two subs, and then there was three subs. So this is something that has changed throughout the, the the history of football. So, you know, might it be uh, something that could continue into the future for you as a positive thing? Yeah, I think so. And I think it may then have some really positive knock-on effects, like in terms of how people treat concussion and stuff like that, or head injuries. Maybe people will be more um, conservative in terms of saying, right, we don't know how this this player is, so therefore take them off because we know that we have five subs now. It's not as, it's not as impactful risking... Mm. And I think that there have been, we've seen a number of situations where players just should never have been sent back out on the pitch yeah. because the manager didn't want to use one of their subs. Um, I quite like it. And like you said before, you know, um, used to be one sub, used to be two I, I, subs. I don't like to... it. I've just had a horrible thought. Go on. What, go this, on. What, what this would do for tactical fouling. You think of a really cynical team and the amount of extra yellows you could rack up. Or just knowing that you could push it so far physically and just have a play. You could basically sacrifice a couple of players and be like, you can just be dirty for a significant period of this game and then we'll just pull you. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like, no, that's yeah, just my yeah. kind of like, that's just, I mean, I love the idea. Of all, the, all the things that Ryan's mentioned are excellent points. The concussion, that's great from a health point of view. But me, you know, thinking of the darker angels of our nature and just how a very, in quotes, pragmatic coach would use that against the bigger team or even against a team that was playing more expansive football and would just say look we've got these five subs we can just have a couple of players on that team who'll just wreck and we can just pull them mm. i mean it could be exploited but i mean you look at someone like manchester city who to me are probably the 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 experts people will think of someone like uh burnley or, or stoke as the kind of team that you're referencing here but manchester city you know, they play brilliant football, but they're also masters of that tactical fouling thing. They probably get away with it more because they're, you know, it's one thing, uh, David Silva making a little ankle tap on somebody as opposed to Ryan Shawcross, you know, careering through their testicles. But, you oh, know, God. it is yeah. it, it is something that's not simply reserved for what people would consider brutish football teams. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, and that's fair. I was thinking actually of uh, one big club in particular. It weren't City. Um, right. I won't name them. I won't name them. But 
yeah, I just that is a concern of mine that you just see it, you know, you did see it in other sports like tactical fouling, rotating the strike. You see it already in football, to be honest. But I think it would create more room for that. So I'm just a bit concerned could about it, the two extra sets. Could it not lead to another kind of innovation within the game in the sense that, like, if you if if we have that five-sub thing and it keeps going yeah. and it becomes a problem, is um, the idea of something like a sin bin, uh, as American as that sounds and as horrific as, as it might sound to certain people, is that not something that could... Uh, be introduced in into football because sometimes you know a guy who makes a cynical foul he gets a yellow card but really there is absolutely no uh, benefit to the team that has been fouled or significant punishment for the team that made that foul right you're not properly punished for what you've done unless it's something like denying a clear goal scoring opportunity but there are moves and fouls that 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 happen um you know further up the pitch and everyone says what a great foul that was but in reality it, it has spoiled something within the game and it deserves you know something more than a yellow card if it doesn't deserve necessarily a red card so mm. Maybe there's something to to take from it from that point of view. I love that idea. Sorry yeah. to jump in, Ryan. I love the idea of a sin bin actually because, you know, you see the effect it had in the Rugby World Cup final when Australia played New Zealand, and it really, really hurt mm. um, New Zealand. Actually, it really hurt them at a crucial point, and they had to pay for that. And I just think, yeah, I mean, one thing I will say about the five subs, and in defence of the five subs, alongside Ryan's point, is the physical exertion that football places on the muscles of players. You know, look how much faster football has got in the last 10 years alone, right? Mm. Like 90 minutes 90 min in 1990 is much less intense than 90 minutes now because of the nature of the physicality of players. So the five subs actually allow teams to start with the same level of intensity, but no, they can give... I mean, look at this. Imagine that there might be a player in future that's like the best player in the world actually has intensity for like... 60 minutes of a game yeah only really only really averages you know in basketball the top players actually don't play the full 48 minutes a lot of the time they average a lot of them three quarters of the game we might evolve to a place where we have the top players basically be routinely being pulled off after like 65 minutes taken off pulled off taken off after 65 minutes i know the five subs are going to have an impact but there's, gonna have there's an innovation for football <laughs> <laughs> you're going to leave that in aren't you you're oh gonna... <laughs> i fucking am yeah for sure <laughs> oh my god very oh different my... kind of sin bit <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness i better drink some holy water after this oh my goodness sure anyway continue with your very salient point despite that uh... <laughs> Yeah, so like we might see a, a moment in future where the top players are routinely taken off the pitch after about 60, 65 minutes and it'll be totally normalized mm. because we've got... And then what'll be really exciting is we might have players who become the impact subs who's who, who, whose job is to basically come in and provide half an hour of astonishing intensity yeah. against tiring defences. And we're already seeing an evolution of that. You can argue we've seen elements of players who do that already, like kind of Solskjaer. They might look back... Um, 40 years now ago, actually Solskjaer was the prototype, a player that could come in, get to the pitch of a game very fast, read a game quickly, and he might be the kind of ancestor of a player that just comes in, has a set role, either a defensive stopper, a defensive midfielder who's very good at reading the game. So I'm excited to see how football evolves in that context. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it could lead to a kind of specialization in oh, yeah. terms of position, yeah. in terms of players who, you know, who don't necessarily start games, but could be used in, in various circumstances. And, and the, the sort of tactical elements that that might bring could be very interesting. But look, we won't <laughs> dwell on that too much. And we need to talk a little bit about the Premier League and its return. Before we get on to some of the stuff that might be more interesting to us, I think it's probably worth talking a little bit about uh, the title, Ryan, and Liverpool, I think everyone accepts, are going to be the Premier League uh, champions. There's no, um, there's no doubt about that, really. It's just a question of when, not if. Um, but people have talked about there being an asterisk over this. Um, how do, you, how do you feel about that in the sense, of, from my point of view anyway, there's no asterisk over Liverpool winning the title this season in terms of what they've done on the pitch, how they've played, how they've performed, you know, particularly when you think about what they did last season and how how ridiculous the amount of points they got last season were and they, they, they still finished runners-up to have sort of done it again 
uh, in a second season is is really quite something. I think the asterisk for me is over um, is is something for their fan base because they can't celebrate it the way that we would traditionally or they would traditionally celebrate a title. Um, from uh, pure footballing terms, I don't believe that there is any kind of a- asterisk over over the way this season will finish. Uh, yeah, I can't really figure out why people think there is and there's a need for an asterisk because it was they were so far ahead anyway. Mm. They would have wrapped it up in a couple of weeks. I think it's the asterisks may become for the Champions League chasing sides and potentially the the sides battling relegation because it's completely allowed those sides to get a number of injuries back um approach full strength again in terms of squads arsenal included mm. and well i say you know champions league spots hopeful but um but i think that liverpool was so far and so far ahead that i think this is just this is where this fan tribalism stuff comes in and it's uh, i mean i the first thing that i've felt actually when football shut down was real sorrow for Liverpool fans because we know a number of Liverpool fans a lot of my friends are Liverpool fans and they've really been through it yeah they've won you know obviously a couple of European Cups in that time and that's not too too bad at all no but they've really been through it with the league and they're quite an easy target for a number of other fan bases I think in terms of I mean you know fan bases online I mean no one there are no angels in that in that environment <laughs> but but they have been so good to watch in the last couple of years under Klopp and Klopp is such a great manager and a guy I mean we always root for Klopp anyway um I just I feel really happy for them that they're going to win the league I, I I think like you said the asterisk the asterisk comes from the, the lack of ability to fully fully celebrate it or enjoy it the way that they probably would have done mm. although hopefully by then things would have been eased enough that they can have at least some kind of socially distanced public celebration i don't know i just don't it. know how you can do that you know because w- w- when you think about how teams celebrate titles and there's you know the yeah, streets are know, packed and there's buses and everything else is like I just don't know how that's possible. You know, I, I can't say I'm happy for Liverpool to win the title. I'm not as magnanimous as you in that regard because I'm never happy when anyone wins the title and it's not Arsenal. But, you know, from a, <laughs> from from their fans, and my brother obviously is, is a Liverpool fan and has waited since 1990 to see, you know, his team win the league again. You know, it is a shame from that point of view that fans uh, can't in, can't enjoy the the spectacle, which isn't to say that they're not going to enjoy uh, winning the league in and of itself, Musa. Well, actually, I've got a suggestion. I think this is a really amazing opportunity for Liverpool's international community of fans to connect. I think they could do something really exciting by getting loads of fans meeting at designated places all over the world. It's like set times, like send out like Tokyo times and Berlin times and London times. And so everyone is basically online at the same time. And then just have everyone sort of get in on a huge kind of chat room, interactive space. Because one thing that's been really funny about Liverpool during the lockdown is they've had all these hilarious videos with like players from all over the world. And I think you could, you could actually do something really, really cool with players just like popping up on the Zooms mm. across the world. So in, in, abs- in the absence of the celebration, which will of course happen at some point this, you know, this year or early next year, in abs, you know, in, in, in sort of advance of that Champions League celebration, I still think it's an opportunity for clubs to do really, really fun grassroots stuff. I, th- I think this is, an, I, mean, I know it's not ideal, but I think it's quite a cool way to bring community together in, in the short term. Mm. And actually, look, I'm a United fan and this will be heresy and they'll come for me for saying this, but you know what? <laughs> like, <laughs> good luck to them, respect to them. They've played the best football. They've been probably the best team in the world for the last two and a half, three years. Like, I don't have a problem with that. Like, good luck to them. Like, I've always felt, I've always said this to you after every call we have, may the best team win. And they've yeah. been the best team. So I've got no problem with any of that. And actually, I will say they won the league the right way. Um, so yeah, good luck to them. I'll say that on the record. So what? Fair enough. <laughs> I'll, get excom- I'll get excommunicated now. But yeah, that's why I feel. Let them come for you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think they what can't I- get me. I'm <laughs> offshore. I'm offshore. <laughs> Wise move. Um, I, I think what, what's, what happens beneath that obviously is going to be the most important thing. And, you know, Manchester City are, are in second place. 
Mm. Um, just to remind ourselves of the table as we go back into the uh, the Premier League, City are second on 57 points with Liverpool out in front on 82, which just shows wow. you the, the, the gap. Leicester City on 53 in third. Chelsea are fourth on 48. United fifth on 45 points. We've got Wolves on 43 points. Sheffield United on 43 points. Tottenham on 41 points in eighth. And Arsenal in ninth on 40 points. But, of course, with a game in hand, unfortunately, that game in hand is against is against Manchester City. So the scrap for European places is the most interesting thing about, uh, you know, the top half of the Premier League. There are some teams, obviously, that are going to be battling, you know, relegation. You look at Brighton, West Ham, Watford, Bournemouth, Aston Villa, uh, all involved in a big scrap down the bottom. But the European places, I think, are the ones that that um, that we're most focused on. And Musa, do you do you view top four as uh, a really important thing for Manchester United to 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 achieve this season. Of course, yeah? of course. Yeah, look, I think people underestimate how important it is to regain some form of aura. You look at Arsenal, right? Mm. When Arsenal, even when Arsenal was struggling to win, they still had the aura. They were still the team people were tuning and watching, and enjoy playing, and that aura lasted a few years after. United's completely evaporated within about two years, mm. and they have to get themselves back into the mix. They have to be a team that people expect to see a Champions League group. And you know, Old Trafford has to become a place people don't want to go again. Instead of right now, what it is, which is basically a theme park for visitors, they can mm. come and like stretch their legs at their leisure. It has to be it's got to be intimidating um, again. And I think that the top four is absolutely part of that. And just can I say, while we're here, shout out to Sheffield United, who've had a quietly astonishing season. Yeah. It is absolutely unthinkable that they would have done, well, maybe not to the people within the club, but to people outside the club, it's unthinkable they would have done this at the start of the season. And I've just got so much respect for them. Yeah, I noticed Wolves are a very um, obvious uh, omission there because of <laughs> the way that they're being run and their their agent. Oh yeah, but we yeah. give, give them. I mean, don't get me notice. No, no, no. I'm only joking. I'm really yeah, only joking. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no, no. I mean, Sheffield United have, uh, as Arsenal have, um, come to realise this season are uh, an impressive team and have done very well. And we play them in the FA Cup as well a little bit later on. So. Um, the aura thing is interesting, Ryan, because I feel very much like Arsenal have lost a lot of that, and they have done in the in the last number of seasons. You know, having been a team that I suppose were were there was criticism for just finishing in the top four at times because expectations were high and standards were high, and people wanted more than a top four finish. And now we're in a situation where, under normal circumstances, a top four finish would feel very, very good indeed and and restoring some of what we've lost is important i just wonder whether this season arsenal might be better off without european football next season if that makes sense because there is a big rebuilding job to do things have gone terribly wrong this season and it's you know the consequence of more than one thing it's more than the job that Unai Emery did it's you know something that we've got to look at from top to bottom in a in a sort of holistic way if you like when we're analyzing where Arsenal are you look at the impact of the Europa League um Arsenal lost six of their last 12 Premier League games in the first season where we were in the Europa League and last season as we got to the final, the, the previous season we got to semi-final, um, we, we fell apart because of the focus on the Europa League and maybe the physical demands of it. And I just wonder if we could rationally, objectively, with perspective, if you like, look at Arsenal next season not playing Europa League football as a positive thing in order to get ourselves back to where we want to be? Or is that too much of a step backwards? Is it too is it too damaging financially, even if the financial rewards of the Europa League are, are uh, not as great as, as being in the Champions League? I personally would prefer a, a season out of Europe completely. Mm. I think that few players within that Arsenal squad will, um, will base decisions of their future on whether Arsenal are in the Europa League or not in the Europa League at all. Yeah. I think that it's Champions League or or whatever. And I think also for the fan base and just for the, the whole vibe around the club, the Europa League feels 
a little bit like a lose-lose situation because we're still judging Arsenal's performances in the Europa League through the eyes of a Champions League club. Like to us, Arsenal is still a Champions League club for many, mm. or for many fans, because it's still very recently that we've dropped into the Europa League. And I think that you kind of, the level of expectation there is so high that I struggle to see the benefit, unless you are literally going to win the, the thing, which isn't easy. I don't like that. You know, this isn't some yeah, yeah, yeah. Sunday league kind of tournament. Um, I think that there aren't a lot of benefits to it apart from financially. So one season out of that, I think with um, a proper preseason under Mikel Arteta and actually giving him as much time as possible on the training ground with players for a season, I think could be really, really beneficial for Arsenal. And something that we haven't seen in our recent history because we've been in Europe every season. So um, I would actually, I'd, I'd be really into it and I'd be really interested to see how it affects the club going forward because it's going to tell us a lot, I think, if Arsenal don't get into Europe and they have one full season with, you know, far fewer games. Mm. I think f- that will tell us at the end of next season really where we are or where we're going as a club. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, Sorry to cut across. I don't think, I think you're right. I don't think Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang's future is going to be decided on whether or not Arsenal have Europa League football or not. I don't think um, the fact that we won't play in the group side, I don't think it'll be a deal breaker for him. I don't think that will be the deciding factor. And it, it, it strikes me that maybe in order to take the step forward that we all want Arsenal to take, we do perhaps need to take um, a step backwards. And that's not to say we haven't taken steps backwards in the not-too-distant past, but to give ourselves the best chance, if you like, of finishing in the top four, of finishing in the Champions League places, a season without the distraction of the Europa League um, might well be a, a reasonable thing. Yeah, 100%. And I think the thing that this Arsenal squad needs coaching... It needs really, really, really coaching. And I think if you look at the Premier League, we took top four for so... like we, Arsenal fans took top four for granted for so long. And I think it's highlighted how just how great a job Arsene Wenger did, not just as a coach, but also as an executive, because he was essentially operating four or five roles within the football club. And um, I think that it's now shown how strong the level of coaching is in the Premier League. Like Moose and I talk about this quite a lot, how deep the the coaches go yeah. in the Premier League. Chris Wilder is a prime example. Chris Wilder is a really, really, really good coach. Uh, Nuno as well at Wolves, despite what else is going on at Wolves, is a really good coach. And you see that on you see that in their team's performances. And whilst I sympathise with Unai Emery a lot, um, and I didn't like a lot of the stuff that got thrown at him, I, str- I think he was trying, he wasn't coaching the team to the best of its ability at all. And I think... Arteta needs as much time to coach the players as possible. And I remember, th- I can't remember what book it was, but I remember seeing Carlo Ancelotti talk about how, you know, if you're playing in Europe, the actual time you get on the training ground is a matter of hours a week with a squad. Um, and I think if we can turn that into days for a full season, I think it will really benefit Arsenal going forward. But also, not just in terms of, I think we, we, we're we looking at this as a league uh, season to season where we finish getting back into Europe, etc. But if you look at the age profile of a number of um, players in that squad who have got real potential, having a season outside of Europe where they are fully coached as much as they can be could really benefit Arsenal going forward at a period where football finances are going to, are in question in terms of, yeah, I think you're going to, you, we're not going to have as much money mm. Uh, transfers aren't going to be as high I don't think initially so coaching those players to get as much of their potential maximised as possible is absolutely key for Arsenal going forward because Arsenal may have to rely on flipping some of those players down the line yeah I mean, Musa, that is a, a a really interesting aspect to the way football is going to develop. Um, we don't really have any idea of what the transfer market is going to be like. I don't think what Chelsea are doing and have done over the last couple of weeks is is really representative of what the market is going to be like for most clubs and and how player trading is going to go and how you know the the ability of clubs to 
pay wages that players are used to now is going to have an impact on on you know whether you can get rid of a player or not like why is a player with a year's contract that you might say well we've got to sell him why is he going to go anywhere you know if he's going to get full wages at Arsenal or United or whatever it might be uh, for a move to a club which is going to pay him 30-40% of what he's on so that's going to provide a, a complication so I think there is going to be uh, a move towards youth and a uh, move towards filling space in the squad via your academies. So uh, having time to work with young players, I mean, I suppose there's two things. One, you get time to work with them. The other, the other thing is um, maybe the more you play, the more you develop. So it's maybe finding the balance there. But I do feel like from an Arsenal point of view with this clutch of young players that are coming through, and I know that there are, um, you know, there's a generation of, of young players coming through at Manchester United as well. Um, you know, this is an interesting aspect as to, you know, how squad building is going to go and how it might be for, for uh, players and teams to develop. Absolutely. And this is it's going to benefit two sorts of club, I think, broadly. It will benefit wealthy clubs who can afford to hoard players, unfortunately. Mm. But it will also benefit opportunistic smaller clubs with outstanding coaches. Because if you've got, you know, someone with the kind of co- coaching quality of like a Pochettino, a, a sort of lower league club who says, look, give me those players. I can take them and improve them. I can add 25, 30% to their performance as opposed to I'll buy a player off the shelf who's ready made. Um, and I think that it will benefit the kind of um, the more strategic clubs at the slower, at the lower level. But unfortunately, like so many things, this pandemic, it will only accelerate the inequality that already existed in most cases, unfortunately, I think. Mm. Are you confident about um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's ability to work within this sort of environment as a coach? Uh-oh. I, I think that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is a good coach. Mm. On his day, a very good, on his best days, he's a very good coach. But I do not think he is consistently an elite coach. And I think that extra, the extra coach, the great coaches. If you look, let's let's do a comparison in Germany. So you have like Hansi Flick, who's coming at Bayern, and Nico Kovac, who was there, who is you know Nico Kovac is a very good coach. But I think that Hansi Flick is emerging as an elite coach, and you saw Nico Kovac and couldn't really get the same performance out of Thomas Muller that Hansi Flick got out of him. And you saw Ancelotti and you saw, you know, Ancelotti, outstanding record, very, very, very good elite in Europe mm. over the course of several leagues, not always consistently elite. And you saw that extra 15% that Guardiola gets out of a player. And I think that's the difference. At the margins of the Premier League are that small in each game, but they add up over the course of a season. And my fear is that over the course of several seasons, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's, the small margins that he will fall short by over the course of an entire season will end up adding up. Does, that's my fear. Does, that's my honest view. Okay. Does this tie into what you mentioned earlier about Manchester United and Aura? I, yeah. Look, here. here's the thing. Every now and again, coaches come on the market who are generational talents. I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is a good slash very good coach. I do not think he is a generational managerial talent. Mm. And I think that man, there's only, there's, there's very few of those that come on the market at any one time. There's Pochettino, there's Klopp, there's Guardiola, there's Nagelsmann, who I think, despite struggling recently, is still a generational talent. There's very few of those in the market at any one time. And I think Manchester United, whether in the medium future or the long-term future, will need a generational talent in charge of them in order to move them back to the perch that they abdicated yeah well look we'll we'll see um just finally uh and i appreciate your time guys just um your predictions for the the top four um moose are you confident that united can get in there or is maybe the gap you know leicester had had such a good run they got those points on the board and under their belts um your predictions for top four can i be honest with you i'm I'm gonna cop out here Mm -hmm. um Liverpool and Man City, I think, will take the top two. Yeah. But beyond that, I mean, we look at the German experience. It just depends on how they come out of the traps. I know it sounds, but these are such weird conditions. Normally, I'd give you a top four prediction, but because the variables are so different now, because the variables are so different, I would have to, like, have a couple of games to see. Fair enough. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, it makes sense. All, like, 
for example, just a quick example. So Wolfsburg came out and they beat Leverkusen 4-1. And that's a ridiculous result to anyone that watches regular Wolfsburg games. And one of the things I was told by someone at you know, the club was our fitness was so good coming back that Leverkusen weren't ready. So that's the thing that's just such a sort of intangible that I'd want to see first before I make that assessment. Mm, so sorry, I, listen. No, sorry, no, that's listen. okay. No, I think it's an unfair question, actually, because how can anyone, how can anyone make a prediction um, in this context, in these circumstances? Because it's not like we've experienced anything like it before. We have no real idea, you know, beyond what you guys have seen in Germany, how the clubs and how the players are going to react in terms of, of fitness and how many games it might take teams to to get up to speed. Uh, you know, Arsenal, for example, uh, aren't necessarily um, fast out of the blocks a lot of the time. So mm. whether that has an impact on on how we play and, and the, the results that we can achieve remains to be seen so yeah okay yeah. I, I retract the question um oh, i won't i won't ask you ryan Never retract. no okay fair enough but i won't ask ah. you to to go down that ryan unless you have strong thoughts on this um yeah i, I don't know i mean I, it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up how it how it is now ultimately mm. i think i think those i think leicester and chelsea probably have enough to get over the line just in Come terms on. of depth so. um but yeah like musa said it's I think the th the first two or three games are going to be so key because we saw that in the Bundesliga where um, a side that started and looked really sluggish one week looked super sharp after two or three. And mm. also just how different one in... Because you've got such a condensed... You've only got nine games left in the Premier League or some teams have got ten. Mm. It's It's just one or two injuries can completely throw the whole thing open. That happened in Germany. Bayern played... Uh, Dortmund in Dortmund with Jaden Sancho was still on the bench and wasn't fully fit and then played Leverkusen away without Kai Havertz who was injured so they had a little bit of luck in those two games which yeah. were probably their two trickiest away games so little tiny things like that just matter so much more than they do in the wider when you've got the whole 38 games to play Musa you were going to come in with something there? Yeah I was just going to say in the absence of me naming a top four I'd like to name my top four hopes for all ask cast listeners okay love peace, love peace charity and justice for all <laughs> seems <laughs> seems like a good throw, way to end it <laughs> had to throw something cheesy in there oh no, for just sure to say like just want to say i, I want to say actually andrew look i love the ask cast i love the community of listeners you've got and it's a real pleasure to be on here i thought i'd say that on the record because i don't say it enough oh, well, thank i feel you. like oh, i feel like the that. pandemic we've had makes me a bit more i'm becoming cheesy in my old age but i also want to say that i'm grateful for podcasts like yours that have been really standout listens during this tough lockdown for a lot of us and i love the fabric ass interview and just the rest of what you've done so yeah thank you for that it's oh, been brilliant. really amazing well thank really you guys amazing. it's been good to have you on and good to do this a uh, little bit of a crossover and you know having pulled off the players uh, earlier on in the show i'm glad we can have <laughs> i'm glad we can have a happy ending <laughs> thanks guys thanks. cheers andrew <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to Musa and to Ryan. You can find them on Twitter. Musa is at Okwanga and Ryan is at Ryan Hun. That's uh, Hun with two N's at the end. The podcast, if you're not already subscribed, is great. It's called Stadio. They're at Stadio on Twitter. And you can find them on all the usual podcast platforms and apps and what have you. So, uh, so get into it. If you're looking for something new to listen to, if you haven't already, uh, get on board with Stadio. Anyway, thanks to the last. It's interesting chat. Hope you enjoyed it. And not much to add to all that, to be honest, because next week it's all going to kick off. You know, football and then pre-game, post-game, pre-game, post-game, reaction, action, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, our lives will be... Um dominated by football once again i suppose uh looking forward to it in some ways it could have been a better start than man city away but hey what can you do like i said at the start james and i will be here on monday with an arse cast extra so please do join us for that as ever thank you very much indeed for listening thank you uh, for your continued support we're almost there we've we've dealt with lockdown and i know for some people it has been much more difficult than it has been for others, but I don't think it's been easy for anyone. And, you know, here we are three months, three and a half months down the line, and we're getting some football back. And that's a thing that we can enjoy. I was going to say regardless of what happens on the pitch, but I think what happens on the pitch will dictate our enjoyment to a fairly significant extent. But look, 
when it's been gone for such a long time, at a time when we thought that something like this could never happen, it is nice for it to be back on the horizon. So just a few more days and we can get uh, right back into the swing of things. And hopefully our swings will be, I don't know what's good about swings. Um, Swingy? Yeah. Hopefully our swings will be swingy and not all creaky and oily and like that let's hope it's just like that is probably the worst metaphor slash um whatever the hell that was that i've ever come up with in my entire life and yes i have some shame but fuck it fuck it after three and a half months of 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 lockdown i think we can be excused one thing like that whatever that is it's a piece of shit Have yourselves a great weekend, folks. Until the next one. Take it easy. Cheers. Bye-bye. Join us as we take another enchanting adventure into the world of the angriest man on Twitter. <clears throat> Oi, I tell I have over the last few months become a much more considered and reasonable person. This global pandemic has had an unprecedented effect on football and all of our lives. I understand that your job has been very, very difficult. You haven't been able to work with the players to any great degree for over three months. And for any football coach, that is going to be an extremely challenging set of circumstances. But what the fuck was that we lose to Brentford? Brentford! What are you doing, man? This better not be the star of something, I'm warning you! <clears throat> I mean, um, good luck against Man City on Wednesday. Because if you fuck that up, it won't be the last you've heard of me. I'll tell you that for nothing. <laughs> Next week, another madcap laugh a minute romp with the angriest man on Twitter. Everything is shit!